Without any further ado, on that. Thank you, Fer. And uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming here. I know it's late. Uh, it's challenging for me because I'm coming from Israel, so I'm, it's 4, it's 4 a.m., half past 4 a.m. in Israel. And I'm a bit jet lagged, some of you as well, but we are going to make it through. So we are in Vegas, and I would like to start with a story that is relevant to what's going on here. It is this attack on SANS organization. Who here have heard about this? Okay, quite a few people. So in general, SANS, they own a network, they own casinos around the world. Uh, they have two right here, the Venetian and the Palazzo. They have uh, in uh, Macau and uh, Singapore and other places. They are owned by uh, Sheldon Edelson, who in uh, December 13 had some comments about the Iranian <laughs> nuclear program. The Iranians didn't like it for some reason, so they decided to get back. They decided to attack the infrastructure. They couldn't uh, breach directly the Las Vegas network, so they tried to find some office. They found uh, another branch in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Not the one Palestine. Um, and so basically what they did was they tried to brute force the VPN. They tried once, two weeks later they tried again. They couldn't break in, so they found, two weeks later, a test web server. They web found the vulnerabilities there, and they went in. Once inside the network, they were able to detect a credential used by a systems administrator who connected from the main network here in Vegas, basically left his credentials behind. We're going to touch on that later on a machine in that branch. And they were able to hijack that cred this credential and get back into the main network. And from there, you know, it's like any other malware worm, just compiled it inside the network. Using those credentials, they operated inside, collected information, destroyed information, and uh, as a coup de grace, they published sensitive information on SAN's own website, like just to in your face, as they say. And basically what they did, they destroyed the entire network uh, IT infrastructure of, uh, of uh, the casinos over here, including uh, one interesting aspect uh, for those of you who have seen the Ocean Eleven movies, right? They had this whale program, right? The high rollers program. So all data was destroyed regarding this program. Basically for a few weeks the casino couldn't identify who the high rollers are, which is very problematic. Now all this happened due to a single password, or basically a single hash, right, of password being compromised. And here we are going to see what... No, 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 sorry. Should we turn it on somehow? There's a controller on the... Let's try this again. Once again. Good morning, gentlemen. Please be seated. I see we're still dressing in the dark, Eugene. Once again, don't call me Eugene. A recent unknown intruder penetrated using a super user account, giving him access to our whole system. Precisely what you're paid to prevent. Someone didn't bother reading my carefully prepared memo on commonly used passwords. Now then, as I so meticulously pointed out, the foremost used passwords are love, sex, secret, and God. So, would your holiness care to change her password? Who oh, oh, recognized the movie? The actor. Right, I expect everybody here to recognize the movie. It's a 1995 movie called Hackers. One of the first one is Angelina Jolie. Another reason to see it, besides being professional <laughs> relevance. But basically, it's 20 years ago, and it discusses the same problems that we have today. Okay? Of uh, several accounts with uh, high privileges that, if compromised, enable an attacker to do whatever they want in the network. So, before we continue, I'm going to try something new that I haven't done before. We are going to try polling. 
this presentation. So please go to this this website, phone to the side. Use this call ID. Come on, take out your phones. Everybody's connected nowadays. <laughs> Let's try to run the first poll just to see that this thing works. Yeah, no malware there. Please. Nothing, <laughs> not, nothing that I wrote. So you play. Okay. We have a first answer. Second one. Third. Come on. Really? Ten. Nine. Hey, seven. Somebody chose black hat. <laughs> I'm really surprised. <laughs> Three, two, one. Okay. Ah. Yeah. Sneakers one. Excellent. Okay, so we know this still works. And we know that Sneakers is the best hacking movie. We did it. Okay, let's continue. So, <laughs> the priority escalation cycle, and this is what we are going to discuss here, basically it works uh, this way. The attackers get in, they compromise some uh, device which has some credentials, they use those credentials, they retrieve those credentials, they use them to operate inside the network, usually it is to gain access to another location with higher privileged credentials, they steal those, and the cycle repeats itself spirally until the attackers get sufficient credentials that will enable them to get to their goal inside the network. It's important to know that the credentials that we are talking about here can be both user credentials, but they can also be application credentials, right? Services, applications, server, every application, every VM, a virtual machine, every, every hypervisor has a built-in account with the highest privileges for it, and there are many network level accounts, including personal administrative accounts, and our research shows that there are usually three to four times as many privileged accounts in an organizational network as there are user accounts, okay? So, <clears throat> and I'm talking here to people who understand this concept, right, because every hypervisor, as I said, has those accounts. Sometimes people, when I present this, find this surprising because they're saying, but we don't have that many administrators. Okay, but you have much more devices. And so when we discuss what the attackers are looking for, they are basically looking for any account that will grant them access and they don't care about Andre's account, right? If Andre's account is the right account, excellent. If it's some other account, whatever. I don't try to specifically impersonate Andre unless I want to. Frame him for case. Okay, almost goes back to the hacker moment. We have actually it's way before, right? We have a machine on which all um, domain users are defined as power users. Okay, so basically any domain account is a privileged account of that machine, which is also wrong configuration. And we even have an, an application account whose password, I'm sorry for the guys behind, is written in the account description. Yeah, so, you know, if you ever need the password, it's right there in the account description. Actually, the interesting, the curious stuff here is it's for the security control. So, let's see that. Okay, so one of the things that we can do with DNA is detect the presence of credentials on one machine that would enable compromise of another machine on which that account has high privilege. Okay. So what we ask ourselves in this research that I'm about to present is how many machines endanger the entire network. Okay. And we are in Vegas, so basically the question is how lucky must an attacker get with their initial compromise in order to be able to compromise from that machine the entire network. And the way we do it is we take a machine, we see to which machines an attacker would be able to access by compromising the credentials on this machine, and then we go forward and we say, okay, there are more credentials here, what machines, what additional machines can be compromised from there, and we count 
all those machines. Okay. So this machine is able to compromise the entire network. This machine can compromise six more machines. Okay. The metric that we define is a highly threatening machine. The highly threatening machine is a machine that would enable the compromise of over 80% of the network. It doesn't necessarily mean everybody has to be old. So what are its late. those five machines are the entire it's network? For me Who are the highly threatening machines here? I'm it's four, okay, somebody? Four, okay. AM. This I'm one four AM. is clearly highly yeah. threatening, yeah. right? And but we also have this one, which is also highly threatening. Well, right, because it's threatening. This one and this one is highly So we are in Vegas, and I would like to start. This is the basic of what we are doing. Relevant. And then we split the networks. Okay. We try to assign a score to the entire network. We are asking how many of the machines in the network are highly threatening. So if there are uh, very few machines around the world, we're saying, okay, it's a fairly yeah, safe network. Right here, the and if there are a medium and number of highly threatening, if there are over 50% of their own by the network are highly threatening, this network is at a very high threat level. Right? The attacker can land basically anywhere, okay? Flip a coin over 50% chance, the Iranians didn't and he will land on a machine for which he will be able to compromise the entire network. So we are going to the next poll. Some of you have networks. So let's try this question. What is the level of exposure of your networks? Okay, is it high risk, medium risk, low risk? <coughs> Okay, the first answer was an honest one. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so we have the majority of the people think that their networks are Low risk, and then we have split a last second. The high network. Oh, okay, it, keeps, it will keep rising. But it won't affect the presentation anymore, so you had it. Okay. So the results, those are the results. Okay, basically what we see is, and those are the results of the research I forgot to mention of over 60 networks that we have scanned in real. So only 70% of the networks are of low risk. And the majority of the networks are either medium or high risk, with a very significant amount of networks in the high risk category. So basically in those networks, the attacker can land anywhere, right? Or not anywhere, but a very high chance that the machine on which the attacker lands will be able to compromise the entire network. Why is that? Basically due to service accounts that exist on those machines. Or due to user accounts. User accounts meaning administrators connected to this machine left their credentials behind them, and now the attacker can hijack them and move. Okay? So we can also try to evaluate the effectiveness of mitigation. Um, but before we touch on that, just if we compare servers versus workstations, as expected, I won't go too much into details here, but the purple line is the percentage of the servers that are highly threatening. As expected, on servers, there is a higher chance of finding privileged credentials, right? Either in applications or administrative. So if you try to assign mitigations, we can try to mitigate the threat from user accounts. For example, if we are using local accounts to connect to devices, we don't leave behind hashes that could be used by an attacker to compromise other devices. Right? If we are using one-time passwords to connect to devices, again, we won't leave behind hashes that the attacker can abuse. So we see that the situation improves a bit. We can try to mitigate the threat coming from the service account. Okay? For example, if we remove the locally stored credentials, if we have some system that provides passwords on demand to application and services, Instead of them being locally stored next to the application, which is the usual case, then the attacker won't be able to find them. 
again, we can use local accounts where possible. And the improvement here is much more significant. So there is a lot of threat that is coming from services. And if we employ all our tools, switch to local accounts, and we zone properly, meaning a privileged account is only privileged to a subset of the servers instead of the entire network, then we can improve the situ situation significantly. There are other best practices that can be employed, and they are even more interesting, I would say. So, two factor authentication, right? It's a known tool, and there's a lot of discussion about how it should properly be employed, but it's a fairly easy case to make that a two factor authentication should first of all be employed for the privileged users in the network, okay? Whoever is the administrator, especially those administrators who have access to our domain controllers, they should employ two-factor authentication. The second concept is tiering, and uh, the people from Microsoft and there are other people who are familiar with that, but basically what we are saying is that not all devices on our network are the uh, same. So we would like to use a different administrative account for every sort of device, meaning there would be a, an administrative account for the workstation, sorry, for the servers, and a separate administrative account for the domain controllers. And in this situation, the attacker who would be able to compromise one of those devices would be only able to move laterally within the tier, and if we are also zoning it, then only within the zone, and not be able to escalate the privileges to the domain controllers. But a more secure approach would be to avoid using passwords from workstations at all. Okay? If we are able to deploy a solution where the user will connect to some sort of a jump server with their personal credentials, which are not privileged, and then use, uh, and this jump server will establish the privileged session for them, then there will be no privileged credential on the user endpoint. Now, we know that human beings are very bad, and we've been discussing this throughout this conference, at setting passwords. Human beings set weak passwords, human beings set, they reuse the same password over many devices, they will assign passwords and not change them for a long time, sometimes never change them at all. They will use global passwords that are applicable to many devices, Okay, and this is, okay, they're all a bit jet lagged, but this is just wrong, okay? For those not, who have not yet seen this episode, it's probably one of the... We're talking about cybersecurity today and how safe people's passwords are. What is one of your online passwords currently? It is my dog's name and the year I graduated from high school. Oh, what kind of dog do you have? I have a Chihuahua Papillon. And what's his name? Jameson. Jameson. And where did you go to school? Um, I went to school back in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. What school? Uh, Hipfield Area Senior High School. Oh, when did you graduate? In 2009. Oh, great. It's like my cat's name and then just like a random number. Okay. Has you had this cat for a while? Yeah, she's my childhood pet. Aw. And what's her name? Her name is Jolie. Jolie. So like a password of yours would be Jolie and then a number. Yeah. Like number one? Uh, like my birthday. Oh, when is your birthday? Uh, June 12th. Oh, nice. Uh, what year were you born? Uh, 95. Oh, great. So Jolie, 6, 12, Nine. 95. Yes. Got it. Gemma. One, two, three. Spell G E M M A. Well, most of them are in Italian. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. That's so, like, cool. like, what's a good Italian password? Uh, my grandma's name. What's your grandma's name? Uh, Maria. Maria. So, Maria is your password? Oh, yeah, now you know my password. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I assume your administrators won't give out passwords to somebody coming up with a mic on the street, but human beings are just bad, very bad at setting passwords. And we would like to prevent human beings from ever setting or touching the privileged password, which is the most sensitive. And this is where, I would say, the most significant improvement that can be made in modern enterprises can be made. 
And it is to set a system, an automated system, that will manage all the privileged passwords by itself, and then change the passwords according to the policy and enable access according to the established workflow to use those accounts when needed. This way, the human beings will only be able to manage their own personal password, which is not privileged by itself. So I will end here, and um, I will open up to questions if you have any. But basically, we went through an attack scenario. We described the exposure of networks to such attacks, and provided some best practices. So questions on any of those? I'll work. Yeah. single point of failure, we are basically describing two aspects. One is the availability of this system, and there are, of course, disaster recovery, high availability solutions and others. But we are also discussing the security of the solution. So you have one point of failure, and if it is compromised, then what happens to the entire network? And basically here, we have a conceptual issue, right? Whether it is easier to protect hundreds of endpoints, each of them using an administrative account, or to have a one highly secure solution, okay, on which we can employ all our security understanding and our detection mechanisms to avoid such compromise. So, we believe that this approach is much better, and it is possible, okay, we know that it's possible. But I understand your point, okay, it's a decision that an organization needs to make, and uh, it does sound like putting all your eggs in one basket, but this basket is highly protected. I don't know. I, I'm not sure how this metaphor should be developed. So have if anyone has a good metaphor on this, on the basket, I'm not sure. Yeah. Passport systems that have a password authentication disabled if you use public key authentication. Sure. So, uh, either public key or SSH keys, uh, it is also possible to use this or similar system, and it is crucial to manage. For example, with SSH keys or public keys on the same network, you have keys that are left behind after accounts are disabled. You have keys that are never changed, okay? Which are also, if I just, just recently there was a Cisco store, right? With the keys that, it, an SSH key that just wasn't changed. So, employing the same approach to SSH keys and PKI or any other public key uh, solution is, is also wise, okay? And it's becoming even easier. You can now employ a different mode of authentication, including two-factor authentication, two legacy systems that didn't support them before. Because you are separating the personal authentication from the privileged authentication, you can now employ two-factor authentication on the legacy mainframes that wouldn't support it otherwise. So there are many combinations that become possible. Okay, yeah. Well, would you uh, protect that machine? Would you just zone? Yeah, so many uh, approaches here, but first of all, take it out of the domain entirely. Okay, only have local ad admin access to this machine. Uh, we secure specifically in our solution. I'm promoting the concept here, I'm not talking, but we employ a uh, proprietary uh, secure protocol to communicate with it, so any other communication to it is uh, prevented. Uh, local security controls, including strong encryption on them storage itself, and, and there are several other controls that you can discuss it with you later. Yeah, we're going to stop, uh, you know, uh, time is out, but thank you, Andre, for your Thank you. <laughs> I'll be here.